Um, for three years, I worked at Catholic Answers as an apologist, and we'll explain what that is, but an apologist is someone who defends something. Uh, and so I got to rub shoulders with a lot of people who are a lot more intelligent than me and travel the country in, in defense of the Catholic faith. And so it's something I'm really passionate about. And so I think you'll find today's talk interesting. Before we begin, do you mind if we say a prayer? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we thank you that we're Christian. We thank you for the tremendous blessing that our baptism was, which incorporated us into your body. We pray for the Christians of this country and Christians who are persecuted throughout the world, especially in Iraq. We pray, Lord, that you would give us a hunger and a love for truth so that we could not only love it and follow it, but then desire to share it with those around us. We thank you for the faculty of reason by which we may come to know things about you, that you exist, that you're beautiful, that you created the world. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. St. Justin Martyr, pray for us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says, always be ready to give a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you. And that word defense in Greek is apologia, from which we get the word apologetics. Now, when I was an apologist and I'd be traveling around, I remember having an awkward conversation with this lady on an airplane. And she asked me what I did, and I tried to avoid telling her because I was tired and just wanted to go to sleep, you know? But, well, what do you do exactly? You know, she wanted to know. So I'm like, I'm a, I'm a Catholic apologist. And she essentially said, oh, thank God. Someone is finally apologizing, you know? I'm like, yeah, not exactly what I do though, just a little different. Instead, <laughs> instead, I, yeah, it's a defense of the faith. Um, our Catholic faith is reasonable. And when I came to Christ at the age of 17, I had a lot of questions of my own, and I had a lot of questions and, uh, that others brought up to me that maybe at the time I didn't know how to answer, and so I sought those answers. And I remember learning that it was important that I know where I should take my questions. Like, if I went to my nan, my Catholic nan, she's like a super Catholic, right? Um, if I have been like, hey, nan, if God is all good, all powerful, and all knowing, why does evil exist? And she'd be like, pray to St. Jude. And I'm like, okay, that doesn't help. All right, and maybe you've had an experience like that and it's easy to walk away and think to yourself, mm, I knew it, Christianity is intellectually bankrupt. But that isn't the case. Um, it, the thing is, for the last 2,000 years, we've had some of the most brilliant minds who have ever lived thinking and writing about these sorts of things. So if you've had the question, uh, I would put money on the fact that it has been answered and probably quite well. So, um, I think that when we think of apologetics, it's, this is the way I envision it, it's helpful to think of it as a three-story mansion, all right? Now, your goal as the evangelist, if you will, is to lead someone to the summit of this mansion. We have theistic, Christian, and Catholic. So what is theistic apologetics? Theistic apologetics is concerned with the existence of God. Does God exist? You know, maybe he doesn't. Christian apologetics is concerned with the historicity of Christ and the New Testament documents. Are they reliable? If Christ really claimed these things that the New Testament says he did, you know, how do we know that that's true? Maybe he didn't, maybe they made up stories about him. And then finally, Catholic apologetics, okay? So if we've gone through theistic to Christian, then okay, we believe in God, and the next step, okay, we accept that Christ is the savior of the world and the son of God. Now to get to that next 
step, the third story of the mansion, we have to accept that Christ established a church and gave that church authority to teach in his name. Yeah? Now, why is this important? Now, look at the illustration for a moment. If there were people outside of the house, we might call them atheists, right? Now, it would be entirely unhelpful if you and I were hanging our heads out of the first, the you know, third story window and yelling about the assumption of the Blessed Mother or the inerrancy of Scripture. Um, explaining the inerrancy of Scripture or the assumption of the Blessed Mother to someone who does not even believe the existence of God is analogous to trying to explain advanced algebra to someone who denies basic arithmetic. Like, wouldn't you begin from the bottom? And I think often we're guilty of not doing that. So in this little presentation, I'd like to speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then for the rest of the time, I'd like to take questions from the floor. So in this kind of 20 minutes, I'd like to focus on that first floor, right? Uh, atheism. Now, I'd like to first begin by saying, I've been really saddened to see the attitude of many Christians in how they speak about their atheist friends and coworkers. There's this sort of smug arrogance that I see in Christians. Maybe it's because they feel threatened, maybe it's because they don't know how to explain the existence of God, or maybe they, the atheist friend brings up an argument they don't know how to respond to and so they just get kind of sassy and stuff. It's not attractive. I think what's really important is that if we're talking to another human being about such a ginormous question, enormous question, gigantic question like, like this, we need humility, right? This is something that deeply affects, these questions deeply affect every human being. And being arrogant isn't helpful. Yes, it can go both ways. Yes, atheists can be incredibly arrogant, but that doesn't make it okay for us to kind of talk down our nose or be condescending to those who do not believe in the existence of God. Now, before we speak about atheism, a couple of words. I think it's important to ask the question, what's at stake, right? There's no point spending a great deal of time considering a question that at the end of the day has no significance on our lives. But this question does. Does God exist or doesn't he? Several years ago in the UK, there were brightly colored billboards placed on the sides of English buses that read, God probably doesn't exist. Now go on enjoying your life. Well, we could try, but it mightn't be that easy. Since if God does not exist, we must concede, uh, however unpleasant this conclusion is, that ultimately there's nothing special about our universe or the beings that inhabit it. You and I are merely the end result of matter plus time plus chance. This universe has been coughed into existence by a blind cosmic process that just didn't have you in mind. And since the universe is meaningless inherently, it would follow that your lives are objectively meaningless. Now don't get me wrong, you can pretend you have meaning, you can pretend that fighting for, you know, uh, against abortion, maybe that brings you a lot of whatever, good feels or something. But at the end of the day, we're all gonna end up the same place. Not only will you die, but we will die collectively as a species, right? In what cosmologists call the inevitable heat death of the universe. Now, imagine that you could be in that position after everything has just destroyed and all there is is a universe in ruins spreading throughout the universe forever. You could ask yourself the question, did any of it matter? No, it, no not, not ultimately. All of human life is like a spark with an infinite blackness that appears, flickers, and dies forever. Now that's bloody depressing. But just because it's depressing doesn't mean it's not true. Maybe it is that depressing and you will have to get over it. Deal with reality, maybe it is absurd. But do you see my point? This is a big question and it matters a lot. 
So you ought to be interested in asking the question. Now, there are three ways to respond to this question. Does God exist? There are only three ways, if you understand the question and you answer coherently, what are they? Yes, no, I don't know. That's it, those are your options. Yes, no, I don't know. Now, since there are three, ter three terms, uh, sorry, since there are three ways of answering this question, it seems to me most appropriate that we have three uh, terms uh, to uh, identify the possessors of each view, right? And you'll notice that only the ones who say yes or no carry uh, a burden of proof. If I say yes, God exists, and I wanna convince you that that's true, I've gotta give you some good reason to think that's true. But notice this, if I say no, that is just as much a claim to knowledge as it is to say yes. Only the one who says, I don't know, carries no burden of proof because he's not making a claim. Well, those three terms for those three positions are a, a, a theist, an atheist, and an agnostic. Theos, theos, coming from the word Greek word theos, meaning God. Ah, theist, meaning without God from the Greek, and agnosis, meaning without knowledge. Now, historically, these are how the terms have been understood. And yet, with the rise of the new atheism, uh, it's been my experience that many atheists that I encounter want to distance themselves from the historic understanding of atheist. They'd like to redefine it to mean something different. They wanna say something like this. I'm not saying God doesn't exist. Uh, I'm just saying um, I reject the God you believe in or I have a lack of belief. I lack a belief in God. Now, hands up if that has been some of your experience. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So let me, let me share with you a couple of responses to the person who says atheism isn't a positive proposition. I'm just talking about a lack of belief, yeah? The first thing I would say is, with all due respect, I'm not terribly interested in what you believe. Like what I'm interested in is the way the world is. I mean, maybe the reason you lack a belief in God is that you haven't looked at the evidence. It's not particularly interesting. The second thing I'd say is uh, you're sort of reducing atheism so that it's not a proposition, not, not a worldview, but it's now a sort of um, state of mind, a sort of absence of belief. But if that were true, that that would mean my son Peter and my cat Plato were atheists. That just seems silly. It seems like we're reducing something, you know, that we thought had a lot more to say. Uh, but the third thing I think I'd say is this. Is this not a tacit admission that all of the arguments for atheism fail? Because if even one argument for atheism worked, wouldn't you waste your energy employing that instead of redefining words. Does that make sense? Yes, no, I don't know. So what I'd like to do is just maybe consider a couple of arguments for atheism. Because listen, if there are good reasons to think that God does not exist, and no good reasons to think God does, then you and I should be atheists. If there were good reasons to think God does exist, and not very good reasons to think atheism is true, well, then we should be theists, yeah? So, um, give, just someone give me an argument against the existence of God. By the way, I'm not pretending I'm like Mr. Answer Man that can answer all of your questions, but just let's try. Just, what's something you've heard that some people say, it might be an argument, it might be a sneer. Yeah, what is it? Just shout it out real quick. Yeah, good. The problem of evil. Now, I think the problem of evil is the strongest emotional obstacle to belief in God. And I see too many times Christians very too quickly brushing away this problem as if it weren't a problem. It's a problem. Do you remember the shooting that took place at Sandy Hook Elementary? I had to go and give a talk close to that area a couple of weeks after the shooting. It was a couple of dozen people, wasn't it? That this person shot, think of that, these kids getting shot through the chest, the face, 
these teachers being killed. Think about this. This was around Christmas time. Think about the fact that parents of these kids may have had their children's presents wrapped and placed somewhere. Think about what that was like for them to have to take those presents down and do something with them. If the problem of evil doesn't bother you, then you don't, you're not understanding the problem of evil. It's a problem. And I think it's the strongest emotional argument against theism. In fact, in the Summa Theologiae, Thomas Aquinas deals with two objections to theism. The second one is just this, the problem of evil. Entire books have been written on this issue. I'm going to try and answer this in two minutes. So if at the end of this answer you feel like it satisfied you, then you're wrong. It shouldn't satisfy you. Uh, J.L. Mackey was an Australian atheist philosopher, and he put the argument this way. If God is all-powerful, he can do away with evil. If he's all-knowing, he would know about the evil in the world. And if he were all-good, he would want to do something about the evil in the world. But evil exists. Therefore, Mackey concluded that belief in God was irrational. Or, if you still want to say God exists, you should maintain that God is either impotent, ignorant, or wicked or maybe a combination of these three things. Now, while I think the problem of evil is a strong emotional obstacle to belief in God, it is not a strong intellectual argument against the existence of God. Suppose you have an atheist friend and you might say to him, oh, like, how can you believe that when we die, nothing happens to us? I mean, you're saying that when you die, you'll never see your family or friends again? Well, that's a strong emotional argument for belief in God, but it's not necessarily, or at least it hasn't been presented to be a strong intellectual one. And so the atheist would rightly say, I'm not interested in what I want, I'm interested in what's true, so let's look at the argument. Same thing we have to do right here. And when we look at those three attributes that Mackey mentions, we can see that God and the, and the problem of evil uh, aren't logically incompatible, all right? Omnipotence means being all-powerful. Being all-powerful does not mean the ability to do the absurd. God cannot make a square circle because a square circle is nonsense. Uh, God cannot um, create a rock so heavy that he can't lift it. Why? because it's a silly question. Listen, God presumably has infinite lifting weight. So you're asking, can a being with infinite lifting weight create something that's more than infinite in weight and then not be able to lift it? But more than infinite is one of these nonsense phrases. So being omnipotent doesn't mean the ability to do the intrinsically impossible. So, God can create free creatures who have the the sort of free will in which they can choose between good and evil. And God can create the sort of creatures that do not have free will and always choose the good. But if God chooses to create creatures with the sort of free will that can choose between good and evil, he cannot at the same time uh, force them to do the good freely. If someone forces you to choose the good freely, then you either weren't free or you weren't forced. If I force you to do it freely, you weren't free. If you did it freely, you weren't forced. And so just by examining God's omnipotence and the reality of creatures having this sort of free will, we can see that maybe it makes sense that because of free will, uh, God has set up things in such a way that we can choose evils and we would have to just accept that. The second thing would be God's, uh, let's think, his omniscience, his being all-knowing. But listen again, the fact that God is all-knowing should humble us. I mean, if God's all-knowing, if he's infinite in knowledge, then guess what? He knows things that you and I don't. He therefore may have good reasons for permitting evil and suffering that you and I are unaware of, that may remain for us throughout the entirety of our lives completely inexplicable. Think of the parent who takes his child to the doctor to get his immunization shots. The child knows that the needle hurts and he doesn't understand why his father is allowing this doctor to inflict pain on him. He doesn't understand that this needle, this injection, is preventing the the far greater evil of disease. What about God's being all good? 
Lewis said this, when we think about God being all good, it's important that we don't impose upon God our inadequate understandings of goodness, right? <laughs> Many of us have this sort of hallmark Disney understanding of God. What we want, says Lewis, isn't so much a father in heaven as we would like a grandfather in heaven, a sort of senile benevolence who, as they say, like to see the kids enjoying themselves and whose purpose for the entire universe was that it might be said at the end of each day, it's nice to see the children enjoying themselves. But listen, if this is your view of God, then you believe in the wrong God. God's primary role isn't to make us happy in this life. I agree with you. If you thought that was God's job, that we're like God's human pets, and he's got to create a comfortable little habitat to see that we're never disturbed or upset or hurt. Yeah, that's pretty bloody good evidence against that sort of God. But that isn't what Christianity teaches, nor is it what any, I think, respectable monotheistic religion would teach. We believe that God's primary goal is that you would come to find salvation in him and thereby enter into eternal life. And as the philosopher William Lane Craig has said, it's not at all implausible to think that only in a world infused with this amount of suffering and evil would the greatest number of people come to know God and thereby find salvation. Very finally, I think it's important to show this. Far from being an argument against the existence of God, I think that evil can be an indirect argument for God. Why do I say that? Well, what is evil? What is it that we mean? Isn't it just it's the way that things shouldn't be? Isn't that it? Like when someone seriously hurts a child or uh, sexually abuses somebody or steals from them or lies to them for no good reason, these sorts of things, there's this sense like it shouldn't be that way. Okay, well, if that's what evil is, we're presupposing that there is a way th things should be like. But you see, on atheism, that's false. This is just one big cosmic accident. There isn't a way things should be. Whatever is, just is. And so I think it's a good argument against atheism in, in that sense. Right, I hope you're not satisfied. Don't be satisfied. If you're suffering some terrible evil, what you need isn't Christian apologetics. What you need is Christ. So bring that pain before our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament tonight, and if you know those who are suffering, don't preach at them, suffer with them. That's where we get the word compassion. Um, someone shout out another argument. What's that, mate? Why didn't the Bible mention dinosaurs? All right, now here's a very important point. Can we show that um, three-story mansion again? Now, listen, here's a couple of arguments people have against Christianity that just don't follow. I'm not saying you're saying this, but someone will come up and be like, I don't believe in God. Okay, why? And they'll say, because the Bible is full of contradictions. The Old Testament God is like this psychopathic racist. It's just ridiculous. Okay, let's say you're right. Okay, let's say I agree with you. Does it follow that God doesn't exist? Hardly. Look, that would be like saying this. Suppose I say I was abducted by an alien and they did terrible experiments on me in their ships and I've written about it. And you look at it and you're like, this is not true. I mean, this, this is full of contradictions. Uh, I've, I've examined the evidence. It's not true. You wouldn't conclude from that that therefore there is no extraterrestrial life, would you? You would just say this account of extraterrestrial life is false. Similarly, to say the, Bi the Bible doesn't make any sense, I, I, don't, I don't accept it, therefore God doesn't exist is to make the same error. What we're doing here is the atheist is us arguing to the second floor with the Christian apologist about the inerrancy of scripture. No, 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 let's not have that. Look, again, like I said earlier, we're discussing advanced algebra to someone who denies basic arithmetic. So let's walk down and talk about God, and then if God does exist, uh, then it might become a whole lot more probable that Scripture could be inerrant. Let me answer your question in a kind of a sentence, which would just be to say that uh, 
Genesis, the author of Genesis, wasn't concerned about speaking about dinosaurs. Um, I don't even know if the author of Genesis was aware that dinosaurs existed prior to him. Uh, so that's, I mean, there's a lot of things, I suppose, that the author of Genesis might have written about the natural world, and yet Genesis isn't meant to be a scientific account. Uh, it's meant to be uh, a sort of um, a type of writing that conveys truth but, I mean, we also don't have, like, advanced algebra explained in the Bible. That's just not the, not the point of the, of the book. Let me ask a couple of questions real quick, quick. You raise your hand if you've heard someone say something like this, okay? Who created God? Yay! All right, y'all ready? After this, you will never be afraid of that question again. The problem with the question, if everything needs to be created, who created God, the old schoolboys retort, or if you're Richard Dawkins, right, is this. Number one, Christians don't believe that God created everything. Christians believe that God created everything other than himself, yeah? That God is, what we say, a metaphysically necessary being whose non-existence is impossible. So to ask who created God is to ask who created the uncreated creator. You're like, no one, that's what God means. That would be like you saying to me, if your brother's a bachelor, what's his wife's name? <laughs> I'd say English is your first language, yeah? Bachelor just means unmarried, and God means a metaphysically necessary being whose non-existence is impossible. Uh, if we don't, and no one is arguing that everything that exists needs a cause, just things that begin to exist need a cause. So if the universe began to exist, that needed a cause. But if God didn't begin to exist, then he doesn't need one. Someone, I, you need to be real quick, because we're going to do Q&A in a minute. This isn't a time for that. Did someone want to throw just anything else out? Yeah, you've got to yell it loud. Yeah, all right. Is that an argument against God or... No, Okay, so we'll do both. We'll do both real quick. Yeah, so uh, a, a, if you read any kind of textbook on astrophysics or cosmology, uh, the general consensus is that about 13.7 billion years ago, give or take a couple of hundred million years on either side, that all of time, space, matter, and energy began. That prior to their, that moment, there was nothing. Uh, asking what happened before the Big Bang is like asking what's north of the North Pole. Nothing, actually, just south after that point. And I think far from being an argument against the existence of God, that could be an argument for his existence. And this is something that um, is being called the Kalam, which is an Arabic word meaning speech, the Kalam cosmological argument. And that would go like this. Everything that begins to exist has a cause, right? Things don't just pop into existence uncaused out of nothing you know, like unicorns and uh, bicycle wheels and Beethoven and cans of Dr. Pepper. No, these things have causes. We don't, it doesn't just pop into, I mean, if it did pop into existence, you would look for a cause, right? What, did, that, did that just fall out of the sky? Is it on some kind of like fishing line? You wouldn't be like, ah, oh, it just, it's inexplicable. The second premise is the universe began to exist. Now, if that's true, or if we've got better reasons to think it began to exist than not, then we should conclude that the universe has a cause for its existence. Now, if the universe is all time, space, matter, and energy, then it would follow that the cause must be timeless, spaceless, immaterial, and unimaginably powerful, if not all-powerful. 